the plan was to do a video on the uh, capabilities and limitations of the HS-101, that small oscilloscope that we can build ourselves, uh, to subject it to a series of automotive type uh, tests, and uh, maybe alongside uh, what is probably the better known budget oscilloscope, the Hantec 1008, and uh, to see how it fares. The problem is, is that it's uh, 30 below Celsius in the garage right now. It's been like that for the last couple of months. So um, we're not going to be going in there anytime soon. So we're going to run these tests in the comfort of the studio. Not only is it a warmer environment, it's a more controlled environment. I'm going to be simulating signals that are uh, consistent with the uh, automotive tests that we're going to try to replicate. Um, I'm going to be using this low frequency uh, signal generator in combination with uh, the circuitry on this breadboard to generate uh, waveforms that have the uh, frequency, the amplitude, and the profile as best as can be. They're reasonable facsimiles of the uh, tests that we're trying to reproduce. That uh, signal will be sent to uh, the Hantec 1008 and to the HS-101. Both oscilloscope will receive the same signal. I titled the episode, uh, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. I'm just having a little bit of fun here. So uh, I'll start with the bad as it pertains to the uh, HS-101. And uh, the most obvious is uh, it's one channel. So when you put it beside the HT-1008 with it, eight channels, that really kind of stands out. Personally, I think that it's just as easy to overstate eight channels here as it is to underestimate one channel uh, on the HS-101, uh, but it's a bad. Another bad, if you will, is that the HT-1008 is plus or minus 20 volt, whereas the HS-101 version that I built is a zero to 20 volt. Any inputs that are below zero volts are clipped off. Now I could have chosen a plus or minus five volt version of the HS-101, uh, but some of the automotive tests run above five volts and um, there's no attenuation available for the HS-101, which brings me to the third bad, and that is the impedance of the HS-101. It has a 10 kilo ohm, which is contrary to the norm, which is one mega ohm impedance. And that prevents us from using uh, the attenuators, either the 20 to one Hantec uh, one, or the four to one attenuator built on this channel, because these expect one mega ohm impedance to work with. There's another little quirk with uh, going with 10 uh, kilo ohm uh, impedance. When we take measurements with um, either a uh, voltmeter or uh, an oscilloscope, the measuring instrument becomes part of the circuit. Uh, it will influence the circuit. So uh, one mega ohm will influence it less than 10 kilo ohms as the HS-101 does. Um, we're talking about maybe um, 100 millivolts um, of skewing, if you will, uh, to which I say, uh, what is 100 millivolts between friends, right? So uh, remember that uh, these devices here are plus or minus 3% accuracy. So um, you have to take that into context. So let's talk about some of the good things about HS-101. Um, besides being compact, uh, inexpensive and fun to build, it's also quite capable. So um, within HScope, there is a voltmeter module that has logging capabilities. You can log voltages with this module over hours if you wish, you know, for parasitic drains, battery performance, what have you. And I know that people seek out that feature. So there it is in a compact package, this and the smartphone. The uh, CSV file that's generated can be imported into a um, spreadsheet. It can be fully analyzed. It can produce a report to a customer, if you will, or to your own self, and a graph. Quite powerful. Another very good thing of uh, the HS-101 is its uh, superior performance uh, in 
the automotive module within 8-scope. Uh, the automotive module is um, a feature that allows uh, these oscilloscopes, whether it's the HS101 or the HT1008, by using the memory and the processing power of the Android device that it's connected to, it can stream and record for periods of time well beyond what the capability of the oscilloscope was designed for originally. The HS101 will outperform the HT1008 in that regard. Um, it is capable of uh, streaming at a 100 kilo sample per second rate and record, whereas the HT1008 can only do that at 2 kilo samples per second. So here's this small HS101 that one ups this much larger HT1008. Okay. Let's have a little bit of fun and we're going to uh, subject the uh, two scopes to these automotive tests. Uh, the first one we're going to try to simulate is the uh, alternator AC ripple test where um, there's always a little bit of leakage past the diodes and you want to make sure that it's not excessive. Um, usually you try to probe as near the alternator as possible. A uh, couple alligator clips go into the scope. Um, on the positive output of the alternator. The alternator output is um, somewhere in the vicinity of 14 volts usually, but over that 14 volts would be an AC ripple. And um, there's a feature called AC coupling, which is able to eliminate the DC component of that voltage. And uh, what is left is the uh, AC ripple that was riding over top of it. Neither of these scopes has the hardware capability of uh, doing AC coupling, but uh, H scope provides the capability through a software solution. Note that a true waveform of a diode leak resembles more like a consecutive letter M's, uh, but for the purpose of what we're doing here, this sine wave uh, is a good enough representation. Typically, you're looking for less than 250 millivolts of uh, AC ripple. And um, if you have over 500 millivolts, it's considered an issue and uh, could actually um, interfere with the proper operation of the uh, computer modules within the vehicle. Hardware capability of AC coupling is deemed uh, better than the uh, software um, solution that's uh, presented here. So um, uh, hold that thought for a minute. We're going to come back to this. The uh, next test we're going to look at is the relative compression test. It's uh, probably the best known. It's the easiest test to do and uh, in my opinion uh, the best bang for the buck which provides the most information about the state of the engine compared to the effort required to obtain it. You simply uh, put a uh, 650 amp clamp on the uh, starter cable and uh, crank the engine in flood mode so it doesn't start and uh, record the waveform. Of course both scopes are capable of doing that. Um, from that waveform uh, there's a lot of information that can be derived. Uh, the state of the engine. So all of these peaks are nice and even. That means that relative to each other, um, every cylinder has uh, the same compression. So it doesn't uh, point to any uh, issues. We're dealing with an eight cylinder engine. So uh, it takes um, 500 milliseconds to do 720 degrees of rotation, a full cycle. So if you look at uh, one turn, 360 degrees, that would take 250 milliseconds. So if you take 60,000 milliseconds in a minute and you divide that by 250, you find out that the starter was capable of cranking the engine at 240 RPM, which is a pretty good speed and that would give you an indication that the starter is doing its job. That it's also drawing between 140 and 210 amps uh, to do that, which would also be kind of within the range that you'd expect. So it tells you a lot of information about the state of the engine. It also tells you something about the health of the starter. There's another method um, to do this relative compression test, 
that does not involve the use of an amp clamp. And uh, that's gaining a bit of traction. Um, it involves um, doing AC coupling on uh, the voltage across a battery as the engine is being cranked. And uh, you remove the DC component from that and then you take a look at the AC ripple um, and it gives you a very similar waveform that using an amp clamp would. Unfortunately, uh, it's a very low frequency event and the AC coupling solution, the software based one within HScope, uh, can't uh, function at that low of a frequency. So we have two examples here, uh, this one and the alternator ripple test where a hardware-based AC coupling solution would be preferable. So um, here's a bit of a spoiler alert and uh, I've ordered some components and uh, before long there's going to be a build on the channel that's going to do uh, a hardware-based AC coupler. It's going to be based on very much on the construction method that was used in the 4 to 1 attenuator here. There's going to be a couple of capacitors involved in that in case in uh, resin. So look forward to that in uh, upcoming weeks. Let's try some uh, CAN bus diagnostics. So it's really considered a two-channel job, right? So um, let's see how the HT1008 uh, handles that. Um, a note here is that uh, a true CAN bus waveform usually has like intervals in between these uh, bursts of square waves. So um, the simulation lacks that, that's okay. Um, and what you're looking for is that uh, the CAN high and the CAN low uh, mirror each other about the uh, two and a half volt line. So um, how can uh, HS101 uh, even be expected to tackle this job? Well, uh, for sure, uh, being just one channel, there's no way we're going to be able to compare the two at the very same time and see if they mirror each other. But uh, that might not be 100% uh, required. Oh, uh, here's uh, HS101 uh, scoping the, the can high, which is pin 6 to ground, and you're looking for uh, the signal to uh, remain clean and within the boundaries of 2.5 volt up to 3.5 volts. Uh, you can rest fairly assured that if it does that, that it's pretty much okay. Uh, here's uh, HS101 doing the can low, which is uh, pin 14 to ground. And the same thing, you're looking for a clean uh, waveform and you're looking at it uh, that it stays within the confines of the 2.5 to 1.5 volt. So it's not a definitive thing, but you're well on your way to knowing if these uh, two signals stay within their boundaries, uh, that the communication bus is okay or if they don't, that it's not okay. If you recall, I um, stated um, one of the advantages that the HS101 had over the HT1008 was in the automotive module, it could um, scan at uh, 100 kilo samples per second, whereas uh, the HT1008 was restricted to two kilo samples per second, which is not fast enough to uh, capture the CAN bus and to produce um, a record that you can, um, you're able to uh, scroll across. The HS101 can do that. So next we're going to simulate an in-cylinder pressure test. Uh, both oscilloscopes uh, can read that and both scopes are using a 100 psi pressure sensor as the probe. Uh, just to illustrate um, how low of a frequency some of these automotive events are, I'm uh, generating this at a frequency of 7 hertz. Very, very, very slow. And this small signal generator has an ECG waveform to it, which is uh, not identical, but it's a reasonable facsimile to the in-cylinder pressure waveform. And actually, in this example, it, uh, it generates uh, what you would find in the SICK engine. Uh, if you look at the uh, expansion pocket, that would indicate that there's some kind of cylinder leakage, either in the valves, um, 
um, on the compression stroke and that as it comes back down on the expansion stroke the um, the pressure is lower than what it started out at so that would be a typical sign of an engine problem and that it also indicates that there's uh, some uh, restriction on the exhaust stroke because uh, the pressures on that in the exhaust stroke portion of this uh, waveform is too high so either a bad catalytic converter uh, improper uh, functioning of the exhaust valve or something of that nature but here's how the HS101 is as capable as the larger HT1008 to uh, deal with an in-cylinder pressure test. So let's do one final test and um, it's quite a useful one in automotive oscilloscope uh, work uh, which is uh, determining the health of a uh, fuel pump. Uh, typically that's done by uh, putting a jumper across a fuel pump relay and then uh, using a low amp clamp measuring the current through that jumper. Both oscilloscopes are capable of doing this. From um, the measurements you can tell um, whether there are any of the uh, segments uh, that are dropping out on the comm. So most of these pumps have eight segments on them and uh, this example would show that all eight are drawing fairly equally. So uh, from that standpoint the pump is healthy. You would also look at the amperage that is drawn by the pump and uh, in this example it's drawing about six and a half amps averaged out. So uh, that would be a good indication that the pump is also uh, within its um, specifications. Then by measuring the time that one rotation takes, uh, eight peaks, and you find out that that was 7.83 milliseconds, again with that 60,000 millisecond in a minute divided by 7.83 shows that the pump is spinning at 7,662 RPM. Again, an expected uh, range um, for a fuel pump. So I did the good and the bad uh, pertaining to the HS101. Uh, what about the ugly? Shortly after I built this, it was discovered that the schematic had a flaw and that from 0 to 14 and a half volts this device is accurate as has been shown in uh, this video here. But above 14 and a half volts up to 20 volts it's not reliable. Now the uh, flaw has been addressed. There's a new schematic on the HS101 site. I handled it by uh, putting a note in the two build videos uh, to that effect and uh, addressing it here in this video. Like um, the developer and uh, those of us in the group that uh, work alongside a little bit with them, uh, of course, uh, were disappointed with this um, event. Shit happens. So, uh, I remained uh, undeterred. I still think that this is a uh, nice little project, uh, fun to build. Um, you can have a couple of these laying around. You can have them in your glove compartment. But wherever you have your smartphone, you have uh, an oscilloscope at your disposal. There's also um, some plans uh, before long where there's going to be a two-channel version of this. And it's going to be uh, plus or minus 15 volts. And it's going to have the one mega ohm standard impedance and still uh, a very easy uh, build uh, for us. Um, another thing that I like about all of this is uh, how it sharpens our soldering skills, if you remember. Uh, that's something that can serve us well uh, as do-it-yourselfer. And this through-hole technology that we use in building these things are excellent practice for our soldering skills. All that put together, look forward to an HS-102 build from me a few weeks down the road. Hope you enjoyed the video. These guys take care.